G'day everybody, how are you going today? Happy New Year, here we are in the new year. It is so very fantastic to see you. Sorry, it's been a couple of days longer than I'd hoped for. I actually had some food poisoning over the new year period, so I've been a little bit under the weather, not firing on all cylinders. And I also seem to have contracted a cold. Now I do want you to know that I've had a COVID test just in case, because we've had a little bit of a mini outbreak here in Victoria. And I had to sit in my car for three and a half hours for that test to happen, but I got an all clear this morning. So it is just some sort of cold or virus or flu, along with food poisoning. So I'm doing well. But anyway, I'm here, I'm back, and hi. Today's episode, well, you'll know by the title that I want to talk about these things here, lenses, and how there's more to... And when I say lenses, really, ultimately, what we're doing is photography, isn't it? Isn't it? That's what we're doing. And lenses are a very big part of photography. But there's more to photography than just how sharp your lens is. So that is what this episode is all about. But before we dive in, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you so much for all the amazing people who have grabbed one of these. I've brought them from the warehouse. All right, everybody, we are here at the warehouse and I just have to say, Happy New Year, the new year is here. Actually have to check, because you guys have been so amazing, how many orange books they are. there are. And they're in here somewhere. There's 15. Oh. <laughs> Still don't have enough. Because you guys have been amazing. Oh, there's more here, five, fives, fives. These are all fives. I want to take a box of There it is, the orange. And we are starting to pack them today, get them out there. Well, it might not be today when you watch this video. They are starting to leave. You'll know because I'm emailing people and saying, hi, are you sure you want me to sign it or not? You'll know who you are. So thank you so much. The response has been actually rather overwhelming. It's fantastic. There's not too many more left. So if you want to get yourself one, now's the time. I will put some comments below. And if you've got no idea what I'm talking about, uh, this is one of the five jackets I did for my book that's only been able to be given by corporates. So here it is. Thank you again. Let's jump into Matt Irwin and his soft lenses, or as I would more accurately like to say, there is way more to photography than simply just super sharp lenses. Okay, so I just want to start this video by being very clear that I'm not suggesting lenses shouldn't be sharp. I'm not suggesting that lens manufacturers shouldn't keep working and improving their lenses, working on and improving their lenses. I'm not saying that either. And I'm not saying sharp lenses aren't cool. What I'm saying is with our lenses, however sharp they are, what we do with them is sometimes way more critical and way more important than how sharp is it. There's so much more to photography than absolute sharpness, which is also kind of coupled with absolute resolution, because ultimately, the sharper you want something to appear, you ultimately need more and more resolution if you're just wanting more and more sharpness. Because you can have an ultra sharp lens and stick it on a 12 megapixel camera, and you've only got 12 megapixels there. Whereas if you put that same lens and it's able to resolve at 60 megapixels, well, you're gonna see even more detail which transposes to, but is not exactly the same as, sharpness. It's complicated, isn't it? And at the end of the day, I throw all that out and I go, you know what's more important than anything else? And that's the image. Is the image transporting you? Are you going somewhere? Do you feel something? And it's not always necessary for absolute sharpness to answer that question. So I want to explore, discuss, mull, turn over, think about, stimulate the gray matter as to sharpness. And do we need to, as photographers, don't worry about what lens manufacturers are doing, that's fine, they can keep doing it, and then we can use it how we see fit. But do we, as photographers, need to pursue sharpness, ever, ever more and more sharpness, forever? Because there's a whole lot of other reasons why you'll buy a new lens, and that might be because it focuses quicker, or it suppresses chromatic aberration, purple fringing better, 
or it removes focus breathing. There's a whole lot of reasons why it's great that lenses continue to, continue to be advanced, but it doesn't just have to be for sharpness. Okay, again, just to repeat, though, there is nothing wrong with lenses continuing to get sharper. This is not what this video is about. But I want to explain to you in this video is that you can have a very successful career and very successful outcomes and things aren't sharp everywhere. Like, there's way more to it. So I'm going to present, I don't know, four, five, six examples, something like that, of images that aren't all that sharp at all, yet they are highly successful images. Let's take, for example, this image right here. This image is in my top three most successful images of all time. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with sharpness. And why? Because it's photographed on a Canon PowerShot S80, a shot JPEG and TIFF. It didn't have RAW, I don't think, this camera. It was 0.4 of a second at 2.8 and it's an 8 megapixel camera. We can see here the quality is not the greatest. Canon S80 pocket camera with a sensor that's, you know, tiny. So sharpness is not one of the things that I would use to describe this image. But this image is all about setting time, place, mood. It's evocative. It takes the viewer to exactly what that moment was and it reveals over and over again the same sense. And why is it successful? Because thousands, if not millions of people have seen this very same view and this evokes how they feel. It evokes how they want to feel. This is evidence for the prosecution that sharpness does not necessarily mean success in photography. This is piece of evidence A. Let's go to piece of evidence B. Also the same book, Melbourne, a love affair. Now, what I did, if for those who don't know, who haven't been here before, is I created five different jackets for my book. And here is another one of them. Now, this image was shot in 2010, and I finally achieved my goal of being able to capture rain at night in the dark. And here's the rain here. This was something that I'd always wanted to do. And I finally had the technology. And here we have Deckard, the book cover image in its original raw form shot on the Nikon D3S back in the April, 6th of April 2010 at almost midnight in the rain. As we can see here, it's shot on the old 50mm 1.4 at ISO 1250. And there is a more powerful version of the rain falling at night. This is what I really wanted to achieve. Just thought I'd show you that quickly. 1 800th, 50, and shutter speed is a 40th. Now what's really interesting about this image is really you have just this section through here is in focus. That's it, just this plane. Very small section of the image. Everything up here is out of focus and everything down here is out of focus but it doesn't change the mood, the emotion, and what it evokes. And up here, we can see what I was trying to capture. This is the rain falling at night. Everything else is soft focus, yet this is a cover of a book of which this cover and the other one you've seen and the rest of the other covers have sold almost 10,000 copies to this day. So again, this is piece of evidence B for the prosecution of the idea that sharpness does not denote success in photography. There can be other ways to get success. And again, this is evocative of the moment. People who understand this city and this moment, they love this. And this was the second most popular cover of the book. Up there actually with the third cover, which is the black and white one. The new St Kilda Pier image shot in 1991 on the Pentax K1000 with 400 ASA slash ISO HP5 Ilford film on the miraculously not sharp Kiron 28 to 210 3.5 to 5.6 lens. Oh my goodness, Kiron, that's a brand we don't even know anymore. That's how awesome that was. But again, this image was evocative of a moment. 
And here is New St Kill the Pier in all its glory. Of course, it predates metadata. Let's have a look at whatever metadata might be attached to this file. Uh, nothing. I thought perhaps the scanner might be here. So there is no data here. And even at this distance, we can see grain. A lot of grain. And if we zoom in to 100%, it is Grain City. As for focus, well, sure, there's focus on these two pavilions here. Focus. The actual main game is out of focus. But if we zoom out, does it really matter? So not only is this low res, but it's high grain. Doesn't matter. This has been one of my probably top five most popular images of all time. It's evocative. It shares a moment. It's something that people can respond to, relate to, and sharpness and high deafness, etc. is simply not part of the equation as to why an image like this is popular. So this here is exhibit C as to why sharpness, absolute bleeding cutting edge sharpness, is not critical for photographic success in all instances. Released four years after the original book, Melbourne Love Affair Mini, and this was because some of the stores came to me and said, look, we love the book, it's so good, it's going great. Some people want to send it overseas, or some people want to put it in their suitcase. Could you make a smaller, lighter edition? And yes, I did. Here it is, smaller and lighter edition. This is more A4 sized, and the other one is more A3 sized. Anyway, again, check out the jackets. This image here, photographed on the Sony A7R original, 36 megapixels with the Nikon 24 millimeter tilt shift lens. Now I've gone to effort to get all of this and all of this out of focus with the tilt shift lens. The tilt shifts can do more than just uh, correct the buildings when they fall in. You can actually have selective out of focus areas. I actually use my lenses, my tilt shift lenses more for that than I do for the architectural side of it. And what I love about a tilt shift lens, and this is, this is relative to all out of focus areas, is that you can have things that perhaps if they were in super sharp focus would be distracting or you actually don't want to tell the story that's here and you don't want to tell this, this story here is not that important. But what you want to do is you want to tell this story here, which is about the cafe, which is about sitting down in the sun, having a croissant, having a hot chocolate, and that's where your focus lies. So with the tilt shift, you can actually choose a plane about the width of my hand, depending on where your aperture is at and how much you tilt or shift. Someone will tell me which one it is. I never know. Photographed, as we can see here on the Sony A7R original version, back on the 2nd of the 2nd, 2014. This is a 33 megapixel file, although I always thought it was 36. That's because I've cropped it ever so slightly is what that means. Let's have a look. Oh yes, ever, ever so slightly. That's a very marginal crop. And uh, ISO 80, I think that was the base ISO. And we're not getting any metadata through because the Sony cameras could not get metadata through the Metabones adapter that was supplied. Everything was manual. Of course, we have the shutter speed, but I can assure you that this is the tilt shift lens. This is the raw file. There's no other way you can get this stuff here out of focus. But if we look very closely, it really is from here to about here. Whoops. But there's a whole lot of other images captured with these lenses at that time. But back where we were, yeah, it's a very small section sliver through here that's in focus. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Don't know why that's saying loading. What we're using here is um, Aperture, which is a program that's pretty much expired, but somehow someone's made managed to patch it so it still runs on the latest operating systems, which is amazing, but it's a little bit buggy at this stage. But we can see, uh, yeah, yeah, just to reiterate, we can see that the focus is really, I don't know, sitting from about here to about here. It's, it's maybe 10% in the middle of this image is actually in focus. Again, we can see it through through here. Quite strange. Yet, for me, and I'd love to know what you think in the comments, for me, this image still really, really works. So through here would be cars and things that... I don't want to tell that story. I want to tell the story of trees and sunlight. That's it. 
that's what I want to tell. And so getting it out of focus still tells that story, but keeps our focus clearly here on the middle, which is the cafe, which is what I am most interested and excited about. I love this image. Uh, and uh, I only put images on the covers of my books that I love. And so far, all of, all, all of these images have massive amounts of out of focus areas. How is this, how is this working? I mean, is this good? If you, know, if you know anything about Australia, you probably don't need to be told that this is the Sydney Harbour Bridge. It's iconic. And again, using the tilt shift lens, and this is the 85 mil edition. So isn't that interesting? Using an 85 mil lens, I'm on a ferry in Sydney Harbour. I've made not only, I've not only made this out of focus, like a, almost all of the images out of focus, but I've made the Sin Sydney Harbour Bridge a silhouette. So focus is completely irrelevant. The only focus is here in the middle. This is Luna Park, which is, um, like a fun park with roller coasters and so on. That's the only bit that's sharp. The rest of it is not sharp, yet the viewer knows what they're looking at because this is so iconic. And what's really interesting about the human brain, the human eye, is that we can fill in a lot of the details even when they're out of focus. And actually our eye, the way we see is a bit like that. I believe we only really see in the middle. We're actually processing what's in the middle. And a lot of what's in the, on the sides here is more just filled in by our brains. And the further you go around, I also believe color starts to disappear the further you go around. That's what I've read. In photography, we can kind of apply the same thing where you've got a vision and a panorama and then you want to draw focus to where you're actually focusing on. And this is where absolute lens sharpness just needs to be considered. I will also show you, I don't, I don't show this stuff very often, mostly for copyright reasons. This is a company that I work for. They are a university here in Melbourne. And again, when you're doing portraiture, it's fantastic to make the, the subject pop from their background. So you still very much get a sense of, you know, this is some sort of corporate or office environment. You, you still get a sense of that. Here is the subject popping. Again, another example of that as well. What I love about out of focus areas is often you still know exactly what's there, but you, you're, you're, you're able, as the artist, you're able to say, I still want you to get a sense of space and color and texture and so on. But the focus is on the part that's in focus. So you're, you're really able to kind of make editorial decisions with focus. Now that might sound kind of simple, but it's something that I really want you to think about. Because I think some people shoot at 5.6 or, or 8 or whatever a lot of the time when they can actually make further editorial choices. On top of the choice of frame, you can make further editorial choices with depth of field or just pulling things out of focus with something like a tilt shift lens. And I'd like to end this video by touching on something that I talked about in a previous video. Now this of course is yet another example of the majority of this image being out of focus. Here we have focus here and we're in InDesign because this image which has a very short depth of field because it's shot on the old Nikon 50mm 1.2 manual lens that's almost 40 years old. But look at the background. It's absolutely gorgeous. Even the foreground here. I just love what's being created with this lens. And what I talked about in a previous video was the idea of painting, of creating something a little bit more abstract a little bit more surreal painting in the true sense of the word with these out of focus areas. You're actually creating something that in some cases can go beyond the traditional photographic look. And this idea of painting, here's, here is an image from the video coming up, I'll mention it shortly, from the Nikkor Z50mm 1.2. Now, both do I want to tell the story of this ultra high res beautiful metallic object that's just popping out of the image, but also we are able to paint with the background here. And I find both parts of this frame, 
the red and silver and the blue and green Christmas vibe in the background, both parts are equally important. So this notion of being able to paint is still something that I think is is deeply exciting to explore and to play with. And when you get an example of like of the, of like in this image, we have the two types together and they're they're working in concert together. Ah. This is delightful for me. I can certainly see this in next year's calendar. So to go back to the original premise, which is, you know, don't, don't worry too much about how sharp your lenses are. The reality is if you've bought a professional grade lens, let's say in the last 10 years, and it might even be the last 20 years, and really in some cases, even longer, these lenses are sharp. They're sharper than the majority of applications need today. So any suggestion where you hear, oh, you know, this lens, it's 4.7% it's, it's sharper than this other brand's copy of the same lens. It's to me, it's like, sure, okay. But in the real world, how often is it actually applied? And then if you look at a lot of photographs that a lot of people take that are actually successful and used in the real world, like corner sharpness, cor corner sharpness, how, how often is it actually relevant? Now you might go, oh, well, if you're shooting a large group of people, you've got to make sure everyone's in, absolutely. But you, you will be shooting that at 5.6 or F8. I hope you don't shoot large groups at any less than that because depth of field is critical in those sort of environments. So don't worry too much. If your bag is full of lenses, 10, 20 years old, they're good quality lenses, my, uh, my, my gentle suggestion is these lenses are still fantastic. If they're professional grade, good quality lenses, then they continue to be professional grade, good quality lenses. Now, there are always examples of lenses that are made that are spectacular. And of course, conversely, there are always examples of lenses that are made that don't quite meet expectations. I would say in my experience, it's extraordinarily rare that a professional grade lens that's released doesn't meet expectations based on its vintage and time of release. So sure, Nikon still might sell some rather old F mount professional grade lenses that their designs are rather old. And, and it's perhaps time for either A, Nikon to put their hand up and go, shouldn't sell it anymore, or B, the user to go, well, this is a pro lens from, I don't know, 27 years ago. It probably doesn't match lenses of today. No question do we want lens manufacturers to continue to improve and upgrade their lenses. This is not what this video is about. This video is about saying to you, don't worry about it too much. The lenses that you have are going to be spectacular and they're going to achieve amazing results. And at the very end of the day, really, is it how is that, is that 5, 10, 15, 20% difference in focus really going to change that much how successful your images are? And seeing as I've made a career out of things that aren't sharp, like ridiculously mind-numbingly sharp a lot of the time, I would warmly and gently respectfully suggest that the majority of the time it's the power of the image, it's the emotion, it's the story that's far more important than a five or 10 or 15% difference in focus. Now, of course, there are applications where focus is critical, but I would say, I would say uh, with a great deal of confidence that the majority of us, that's not the case. That the 70 to 200, 2.8 that you bought 15 years ago or 10 years ago is still gonna be quite a cracker in the, middle of the, in the middle of the lens. And if you stop it down two stops, it's still gonna be quite a cracker. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here. I hope the sentiment and the intention of this video is come across correctly. That again, don't worry too much about the gear. You've probably already got, majority of people out there have got amazing gear. And of course, it's fine to upgrade. I'm not saying don't upgrade, but I'm also saying don't get too caught up on, on having to spend maybe a lot of money just to get a 5 or 10% improvement. Some people simply can't afford that. Some people can. And if you can, great, do it. Some people absolutely can exist on the bleeding edge and are early adopters. I I'm one of those people some of the time, not all the time. My Hasselblad is not an example of that. My Nikon Z is an example of that. 
But what, whatever you've got, think about the story, think about the lighting, think about the emotion, the mood, the drama. That's what photography is about before anything else. And any pro lens from the last 20 years is very much gonna get that in focus, don't worry. Thank you so much for being here today. It is spectacular to see you. If this is your first time, ay, ay, ay. I would love to see you again, so please subscribe. That would be so ace. Uh, please share, please like this video, it really helps it. And if you wanna see during this holiday season, perhaps you're not working at the moment, down there there's over 270 episodes. You can watch right now, okay, bye. All right. It's time for me to, oh, hopefully I'll feel better in the next few days and then get out there and start working on all of these crazy different reviews. Oh, before I go also, uh, next coming up is a 50, the 50 millimeter 1.2, I call it the visual review. Now the visual review is something I did two years ago and it's all about showing a, a lens off just with pictures and video. That's the next video coming very soon.